My name is Martin Strickland. I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs at YBCA. I'm also one of the co-curators um, of the Bay Area Now. So I'm really excited to have everybody here. Um, we'll do sort of a brief introductions. Um, I wanted to situate you all while you're actually like sitting in the room that you're sitting in. So this is the Curatorial Research Bureau. It's a partnership with the California College of the Arts, CCA, and YBCA, where we um, have a bookstore, a learning site, and then a public forum all in one. Um, so inside of the CRB on like a day-to-day, -day, it functions as a bookshop with more than a thousand titles from all over the world, many of which are not available in the U.S. And it's a partnership with uh, Berlin-based Motto Books, who supply most of the inventory, and the remaining inventory is, uh, comes from Bay Area publishers, artists, curators, and writers. Uh, this space also within YBCA acts as a learning site. It houses CCA's graduate program and curatorial practice. So graduate, se graduate seminars take place here each week. And the students that are in the programs are integrated into meetings at YBCA from curatorial to marketing to communications uh, to bear witness to like the planning processes of exhibition making. And uh, this puts the students in dialogue with YBCA and other Bay Area institutions and practitioners. And then finally, it acts as a public forum, which is what you're all experiencing today. Um, it's an aggregator that brings students, faculty, and other CCA colleagues uh, closer to one another within the Bay Area. And it's a public forum that allows both institutions to connect more intensely with the community. So I'm normally not the one who gives this introduction. Normally that's Jim Voorhees, who's the chair of the graduate program uh, for CCA. He's unavailable today. Um, so that's why I was reading off some of my notes. Are you smiling at me for that? <laughs> okay. Um, and I just wanted to welcome uh, Kenjin Montoya, who will be our moderator. Susie Cantor, who's our um, Associate Curator of Visual Arts and one of the co-curators, uh, along with myself and Lucia San Ramon for Bay Area Now. Weston Churia, who is a um, alum of the band Six and also another exhibition uh, that Susie and I were able to work with him on in 2015 called Work in Progress. And then Rennie Pritikin, um, who uh, among many a wonderful titles that he's held was also the uh, founding curator at YBCA and uh, it was uh, Barry and I was sort of born out of Rennie's brain and, um, I hope that we can uh, like, get to talk a little bit about that today um, normally this room is pretty good for sound we do have a small sound system set up so if anyone is having trouble hearing anybody just let the moderator know and we can pop a little mic microphone. But other than that, um, I won't take up more of your time and I'm going to turn to, excuse me, I'm going to turn it over to Kenji. Hey. Thank you everyone for coming on this nice Sunday afternoon. <laughs> um, and of course, thank you to you guys for uh, agreeing to to talk a little bit about your experience with the Bay Area now. Um, just to give quick context about um, how this is kind of a look back the history of Bay Area now. Um, I started uh, as an intern while I was going to CCA in the curatorial practice program. Um, and I was an intern here in the visual arts department. Lucia San Ramon had just started her position. She came and spoke to us um, at the Curve program when it was still housed um, at CCA. And so uh, those connections were made and I felt really interested in the kind of projects that they were doing. Um, it included like the Tanya Bergera show and working with future farmers. And I just really wanted to be of service and, and be in the middle of it, basically. I just wanted to be behind the scenes. Um, that's when conversations about Bay Area now started coming up. Uh, Lucia was, about a year into the internship, Lucia was very adamant about having Bay Area now uh, return to these kind of tenants that um, that were there at the beginning and so just pragmatically that meant pulling out books from the big like uh, the publications and all of the writing and the um, critical writing the essays talking to curators and artists that had been a part of it um, very quickly it became 
clear that this could be something on its own um, in the exhibition. It, it was important enough, it created these connections, it spoke a lot about the way the Bay Area has changed, um, and I think uh, that that value really grew the more I spoke to people who had participated, and so that's um, hopefully what you guys will see today in our conversations. Um, so I would like to start at the beginning with my start again <laughs> with Renny. Um, so not only a founding curator at YBCA, but like Martin mentioned, um, the kind of beginning of Bay Area now as well, a few years later, can you talk a little bit about the mandate and the mission of YBCA when you started and how that was enveloped into the, uh, the start of Bay, uh, Bay Area now? connected. Where do I start? <laughs> That's, uh, it's a long story and I'd like to give somewhat of the whole context. Yeah. I, stop me if I go too long. Uh, uh, oh, there's so many places to start. Um, San Francisco was going through tremendous change in the 80s, so it has to go back to the 80s. And um, people of color and uh, LGBT people were gaining power uh, through getting seats on the Board of Supervisors. San Francisco had always been a kind of an Italian power. And uh, so that was a real change. And uh, in the late 80s, uh, an activist uh, wrote a white paper, did a bunch of research and wrote a white paper and published it. And it caused a huge uproar in the arts community <clears throat> that he had tracked the city funding for the arts. And according to his research, 90% of the city funding was going to the ballet, opera, symphony, and more. Mm. And of course, in a politicized, even then, a politicized environment uh, where people were demanding more equity, uh, caused a, a real shitstorm. And um, the city's first reaction, interestingly, was to fund a festival called Festival 2000. Anybody ever hear of that? <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, it took place in 1990, but it was called Festival 2000. And uh, it was very large budget. Um, the city put in most of the money, which I think was a few hundred thousand dollars, but that was a lot of money back then. Um, and uh, the curatorial approach was to include uh, international artists, performing artists mostly, very small visual arts people, uh, almost completely artists of color. Um, the intention was to celebrate multiculturalism. Uh, and it was a fiasco. Um, not artistically, uh, most of the performances um, got well reviewed and attended, but uh, administratively it was a disaster and uh, the director who had been hired disappeared halfway through the festival and uh, upon, you know, artists weren't getting paid, artists were flown here from all over the world, couldn't get paid. It was really, really bad. And of course, the right took it as an opportunity to disparage multiculturalism. Um, the next thing that happened was the Yerba Buena. And I, I'm sorry, I have to go back. The uh, Yerba Buena was announced. The Yerba Buena redevelopment was announced in the 50s, and it was intended 
to level south of market, essentially, and turn it into a giant World Trade Center. Uh, there was going to be a football stadium. Uh, this was the old school politics of uh, mostly Italian and Jewish uh, leaders of the community and the wealthy had no compunction of just doing whatever they wanted. Uh, so there was a community here, mostly very poor, uh, uh, mostly, uh, there were, uh, you know what 6th Street is like today, the whole South Market was pretty much like 6th Street. So these people saw this and thought it was blight, and they were doing a, the city a favor by wiping it out and building a gigantic World Trade Center with the intention, because it's the 50s post war, uh, of being beating out Seattle and Los Angeles to be the city that traded with China and Japan. Uh, so, uh, it's the first time in American history that community organizations stopped major redevelopment project in its tracks. And it was announced in the 50s and it didn't happen until uh, the Everglade opened in 93. So, 40 years. Um, and Nothing that you see around you was by chance. Uh, what happened is the radical lawyers in the 60s hooked up with the tough old geezers who lived in these SRO hotels who were mostly retired longshoremen and merchant marines, and they were tough union guys. So uh, they stopped it in its tracks, and uh, the cities. Uh, had to compromise, compromise, compromise until uh, they scaled it way back from 10 square blocks to one or two. And they had to build housing, uh, low income housing for the elderly. There are two or three buildings around us that you walk by every day and you don't know. That's, and they're award winning, wonderful places. Um, they had to put the convention center underground, which is why there's a park here. <laughs> um, and the, the park is completely ersatz. I don't know if you realize that, but uh, it's the roof of the convention center. And on the roof of the convention center, we watched as they put in styrofoam blocks of heavy duty styrofoam, and then they put dirt on top of that, and then they put the grass. <laughs> gives you a different sense of what you're sitting on. Uh, they had to build recreation, entertainment, and cultural facilities for the people of San Francisco. So the recreation is there's a bowling alley and a skating rink. That didn't happen. That took years of struggle from dedicated people. Uh, so the housing, recreation, Entertainment is the Metreon movie theaters, and the cultural facility is where we're sitting. That is how the year of it happened. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, scream, no scream. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a good um, So I was hired in 1992, uh, and March 92, and in October. 93, I had to have the opening exhibition, which had to be inclusive, entertaining, brilliant, <laughs> world changing. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was very, very difficult, but I had a great team. And uh, uh, Renee de Guzman, who's now senior curator at Oakland Museum, and uh, Arnold Kemp. African American, who um, is now the dean of the uh, graduate school at the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, we curated the first three, and that was uh, the brilliant 
nature of the founding years of this place is that in the light of Festival 2000, when the newspapers literally said, oh no, you're waiting, here comes Festival 2000, but now it's got real estate. <laughs> and uh, we were, uh, had incredible skepticism from the left that no beautiful downtown space is going to meet the needs of the community and the neighborhoods and buildings are so old fashioned and we should have flexible spaces all over the city. And on the right, uh, we're saying, oh, Festival 2000, uh, multiculturalism is just a fact, it's going to go away. So, so it was very, very difficult. And finally, uh, we had no uh, constituency. So um, we, we had tremendous attendance in the first show, <clears throat> but uh, we did great shows the second and third year. But uh, we never could get more than 50,000 people a year. And MoMA, by the time they opened a year or two later, were getting 500,000. So, it was bad for our morale. <laughs> um, <Still is>. so, <laughs> but we're here. <laughs> but um, Nail and Blake, who was a great artist, and now long in New York, but he was here for many years, uh, was on. I got him on the board of your Buena and. Uh, he had this theory that he called the Grateful Dead theory that the Bay Area uh, suffered from excess politeness in its <laughs> art criticism. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, like the Grateful Dead, people kept imitating what they were doing over and over, and nobody called them on it. <laughs> <clears throat> so he said, We need an institution with the guts to say, There's the line. This is important. You work. This is <laughs> uh, so he really pushed to do this kind of survey, and the president of the board, uh, Ned Topham, uh, rich society guy, but really loved loved Bart and a great guy, and he saw it much more pragmatically that um, we needed a signature show that we could go back to every year and draw attention. Uh, and I was frankly reluctant at first because uh, I, I thought we were creating a museum for the 21st century with new uh, models. And uh, regional surveys seemed like an archetypal 19th century idea. But I, I agreed. Uh, I was also very worried about people who weren't selected being pissed off. Uh, I had been to Boston, and they had something, the ICA in Boston had done, still might, I don't know, but they had for many years done Boston now. And uh, the artists I talked to in Boston hated it because they felt ghettoized. The only time they could show the ICA was in Boston now. So I certainly didn't want to replicate that. But I got talked into it, we did it. Uh, uh, the other and uh, is that um, the City Arts Commission had done uh, regional shows for many years in, uh, in front of City Hall. And um, they had stopped doing it for many years. So there had not been a regional survey in at least a decade, maybe two decades. So there was this incredible group of young artists. And we limited it to artists under 40. Um, and most of the excitement became around the, the first public flowering of the mission school people. So I should stop there. Sorry. <laughs> mission school's a pretty good place to stop. Um, I think that that's really helpful. I think that, um, especially with the panelists we have, I think it's great to have the scene set, the physical space we're on, the way it got here, how then we turn that physical space into a place of community, and then while all that's happening in the background, there are artists who do or do not get chosen to participate in that exhibition. And so then 
the ripples start to go out. So after the first year, second year, third year, there does seem to be um, like the mission school. There, there are artists that are starting to get noticed, that are starting to um, create connections outside of San Francisco because they, there were collectors and galleries that were coming to Bay Area now by the second and third um, iteration. So that brings me to Weston, who was an artist in the sixth um, iteration in 2011, right? Yes, yeah. that's what I wrote down, so it's definitely true. Um, so as an artist, how um, then did this kind of affect you? Did it affect you? Was there some history to Bay Area now before you were chosen? What's your relationship? What was your relationship to it? Um, and then what was your experience being included? Yeah, so, um, so Kinchin put together these wonderful notes of like each year's, each iteration, and I, I didn't really register until looking through that again. That I, I've been here since, been there in all four, and so that, especially, if, I remember when I was reading through the notes about four. I remember coming to the show and that being kind of this entry point into what the what was happening in the Bay and the sense of like the context that I was entering into, especially since I came up here for school. So it was sort of this educational experience. Um, and in, in some ways, I, this is kind of a side note, but it felt very similar to my experience with um, Kearney Street Workshop and living in LA and knowing about Kearney Street's Aperture Festival that they put on every year and the way that that introduced me to our Asian American artists here and was this sort of aspirational thing of like, oh, did, like Mike Arcega or Robert Gutierrez and all these folks who I was I looked up to and then coming up, moving up here. And so it was the same kind of thing here for the larger artistic context. Like, oh, I remember Libby Black's installation or Hank Lewis Thomas's billboard or his, his video that he had. And so, um, so it was always this thing that, that gave me a sense of the context and artistic legacy that I wanted to be in conversation with. Um, and then I had a studio visit for Bay Area Now 5 and was completely not ready for that. And like, it, I think it was a, a good learning lesson of like, okay, I, I need to step up if I'm gonna <laughs> be a part of this. And so when it came around to Bear and Mouse um, 6, I, I did feel much more ready for it. I was sort of at the tail end of um, what became like a project that I've been working on for eight years. And um, so it was this, the iteration of what I did here was kind of a culmination of, of a long um, period of work. And so it was this opportunity to kind of um, step into this conversation that I had been wanting to be a part of for, for many years at that point. Awesome. So it looks like the line that Naaman presented stayed true. What did it make it in the fifth one? So, and it's also, I think, helpful to know that Renny, um, Renee and um, Arnold did the first three iterations together. Uh, Arnold and Rennie. Renee. Ren no, you and Arnold left. Yeah. Renee stayed, right? Uh, I, I don't think Arnold stayed for another one. No, yeah, he, he went to Stanford to get his master's. Yeah. And uh, Baron. Uh, Yes, Got Baron me. with with Renee. So so the reason I bring that up is that um, it really is this living, breathing thing. So this thing that Rennie spent so much time creating, spending time cultivating the first one, the second one, the third one, it now you can see the shift. So uh, Wesson became inspired when he saw the fourth one, and so he has it. It's now something that's become you something you want to have a conversation with. So it really has now left this kind of. Um, uh, I guess I'm just trying to create moments of uh, of expansion where it's where it has expanded into this it's kind of own thing um, past uh, should we or should we not have a regional show at, at the Yerba Buena Gardens, um, which still would come up periodically. Yes, I think, I think in the fifth uh, one, yeah, can foster can do this. Yes, in the fifth one, the director was on was it was published saying, "Is this relevant? Should we be doing this anymore?" What do you think? Um, think yes um, I thought it should um, so Susie I think we can skip again now coming to this present iteration um, of Bay Area now eight 
when I say that when you and Lucia were really clear immediately that you wanted to return to some of the tenants in the first one, what did that mean? Like, what was it that stood out? What were the things you guys were like, we definitely want to keep this going? And what were the things that you were like, it's got to change up in this way? Um, what well, wasn't an immediate, like, this is what we're doing. It was actually months of Lucia, who was at that time the director of visual arts, thinking, kind of going back to the same question of, do we need a regional survey? So she had thoughts of doing um, like a whole Pacific Northwest, which I don't think there is, and you know, all or just all of the West Coast. And really, was she had done this a, with another biennial, the site Santa Fe, and really be thinking what the biennial is and what it does, and wanted to do that for this, and then came back to. Before we rethink it, because this was the first one she worked on, let's actually just do it as it was meant to be, and then go from there and see how that works. So I'm really, I'm really glad that we came back to doing um, just kind of the more like we kept jokingly calling out the back to basics, um, and we went through looking at the research you were doing at the time and looking in through all these beautiful materials here and thinking about what Renny and Renee and Arnold had started. Um, and really just look back at that first one, which was, um, you know, just <laughs> to speak for any, just doing a lot of um, studio visits and really looking to see what, like, interesting artists, what people are doing, what they're making, and going from there. So instead of, you know, there's been, they kind of vary for each iteration. Band 7 is the one that most people point to as being the most different. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? Because you were, I was like, you were around. I, yeah, I worked on that one, but wasn't um, curating that one. So that one was Betty Sue Hertz and Cece Moss. Betty Sue was the director of visual arts at the time, and Cece was assistant curator of visual arts. And they decided, um, and this was when, I think starting with the second one, it really became an institution-wide oh. initiative. So it was the performing arts department, film and video, community engagement, all sort of did their own thing with it um, to varying degrees. and. Band 7 was very much all the different departments coming together, thinking how can we um, kind of change it up. I think they really wanted to do something different for that one. I wasn't really in the initial planning stages of it, so I don't quite recall. But they decided to, um, instead of curating the artist, what they did for the visual arts portion is they, uh, we did a call for submissions for looking for institutions that were smaller than YBCA with a much smaller budget, nonprofit, um, and so they essentially kind of curated the, the organizations rather than the artists, and then each of those 15 organizations that were selected then did their own sort of mini show. Mm -hmm. And it got kind of like really mixed reviews and um, from what people said about it and the press, I think it was very much on the pulse of the moment of, there's so many art spaces that were closing at that time, and they still are now, but it was sort of more of the shock of it at that time, which was 2014. And I think there were so many of these little artist spaces. So I mean, a number of the, the groups in the exhibition were, you know, doing just like a little space in their home or in their apartment. Um, and that was very much at the moment. So I think it was smart to do that. But then when we were coming back um, for Bay Area Now 8, thinking how that one had been a real departure, um, really wanted to go back to this idea of just looking at artists, doing studio visits, doing the basic thing that is like so fundamental to the work that we do, but never have the time to do because we're always here and in meetings. <laughs> and that was really exciting for us and for Martin as well to be able to go out and just meet with artists and talk to them about their practice and do um, the things that we're supposed to be doing. So that was the kind of the key things that we were both thinking about and kind of reacting against. Um, well, actually, I wouldn't say reacting against Ben but it's more just like, okay, that was that was veering off this way, we're going to veer back this way and see where that takes us. All the thinking of um, Lucia kind of going back and forth with this, should we do this, should we just blow the whole thing up or do something, and instead of doing what it was originally, I think that was actually really important. I think, I know I say that I'm very biased by saying this, but I think it was actually what we needed in the area at this moment, so I'm glad that we ended up doing it that way. Yeah. And also, I just want to, I just took almost like a page of notes from what you were saying, Randy, so this is just, 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 like, <laughs> <laughs> just about like San Francisco history and institutional history of YBCA, so this is, people are, this is very special. <laughs> um, so actually, I have written down, starting with the mission school, but we don't have to go all the way into it, Randy, this is more, um, in the interview that we had, I, uh, I kind of mentioned it earlier today too, is, after two and three, there were uh, there was language in the exhibition publications that started to list artists who had made it, artists that had come out of the Bay Area now, or who had been to Bay Area now and then moved on to a more successful or uh, more well known status as artists. Um, and I wanted to know in the interview if that was like kind of built in uh, 
at all if there was a part of you guys that wanted to kind of launch artists. And you said that it was actually a, an unexpected consequence, that it wasn't necessarily something you guys had wanted to do. So once that did happen, uh, again, with the mission school, you mentioned like Hank Willis Thomas, how, um, can you talk about how you think that, that that came to be, especially since there hadn't been other ones? Do you think it's just the nature of a regional show that people want to pick the best one? Do you think it was, yeah? Uh, I think it's chance, luck, the fact that there was a generation that had not been grouped together and served up, um, but also that there was this incredible group uh, of artists, uh, Barry McGee and uh, Chris Johansson and uh, Margaret, Margaret sorry? Margaret Kilgallen. Margaret Kilgallen, but also the, the woman who's still here. Alicia. Alicia, Alicia yeah. yeah. Uh, and many others now, uh, Ruby Neary. Um, but what was, what was happening was that uh, the most important thing that happened was um, uh, the curator, director of the drawing center. Uh, his name is one of them, and Annie Philbin, yes, it's a lady. Uh, drawing center in New York, uh, started giving Barry and Martin shows, and, and their stuff was something like that. And uh, even though it was not a, a commercial gallery. Um, so work that literally Margaret's show, he from Bay Area now, uh, was shown in an expanded fashion at the drawing center and sold out. So it was a, a learning lesson for us about the difference between San Francisco and New York at, the, at that time. Uh, but then she told uh, Deitch of uh, Deitch Projects, and he started coming to the open. And there was some outreach. I feel like Arnold mentioned, like there was some connections. You guys were, you guys are bringing people in as well, right? To yeah. Well, you know, the rhetoric that uh, we used from the beginning was that because we have this beautiful space downtown uh, to support local diverse artists, uh, showing them was only one step in the process. The other uh, steps were. Uh, having them meet each other, having out of town people have a way to become aware of what the Bay Area was doing, and also to hook up artists, out of town artists, with local artists to get that uh, communication going. So we all know that that's how careers really get made, is somebody goes back to New York or Chicago and says, I saw the most incredible artists to their dealer. And that, that definitely started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking about uh, Weston, for you, how was how would you situate um, Bay Area now as an artist, even as a turning point, as a stepping stone, as a networking experience? Um, I feel like a lot of the artists responded with their experiences specifically to their cohort, or like that you had met artists and. Like Randy was saying, introducing you to artists that you wouldn't normally maybe show with, or um, or be in conversation with, even just in the installation period. You know, there's always times. Um, how would you, yeah? How would you describe that for your particular experience? And then, yeah, it's, it's, some of it like starts blending together after <laughs> a while. But, um, but you know, I, I think even just like remembering because I was in the I guess gallery one which was kind of got dubbed dark gallery because they had dim the light sensor, it had this very distinctive feel. And there was four of us, it was Ron, Richard Walker, and Sean McFarlane and I in that space. And so even just like that envelope felt like it created this dialogue. And I mean, I don't even know that it was, I feel like I kept in conversation with Ron and she was one of my professors at CCA, so there was that nice like, oh, I get to show alongside one of my professors. Um, but also that there was, that did create this sense of camaraderie more broadly, um, just in terms of like, these are people now that I feel connected to. And so when I see they have a show, I pay attention to that. 
Um, and, and I think what was maybe the most surprising and meaningful is that since then there have been people I've met who said, oh yeah, when I first came to the, yeah. sort of the experience I had, that when I first came to the Bay, I came to the Bay Area, now I saw your work in the exhibition and now I want to work with you on this project. And so that, um, and you know, that hasn't happened like, like endlessly, but there, there are these key relationships that I think that, that facilitated and built and that I never would have predicted and you never know who's walking through the gallery throughout the life of the exhibition. But I think that um, it's those moments that, that feel really meaningful, especially since I think so one of the challenges for me was that um, because the, this exhibition was the end of this long period of working on this project and it's kind of floundered for a bit after this trying to figure out what the next project was, it, um, it that, that like several year period after that was this weird place where I was like, what do I do? Where am I going? What, what, kinds of, what kind of projects do I want to do from here? And so knowing that there was a connection that got built that manifested uh, several years later, I think um, made it feel like, okay, even if I didn't know there was like stuff, groundwork being laid, it was there and that did help continue dialogues and opportunities beyond this. Yeah. Totally. Um, Susie, as a curator, those kinds of connections are things that you see sometimes right away in the studio visits, like those kinds of dialogues and things that happen in the gallery, or maybe larger themes that you have to turn into an essay. <laughs> um, but then there's also some that happen later, right after you've looked at the work or you've spent some time with the group that you're going to be going with. Can you um, talk a little bit about the themes that you did see, I feel like, in the exhibition text in the wall and, and in the pamphlet? there's talk about um, the ways that artists in this band eight all were working through different ideas of liminal space, transitional spaces, um, this kind of in-between, um, the nuance of living in the Bay Area and essentially creating in the Bay Area, what that means um, in any one direction. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the times that that came up either in a studio visit or was that something that particular works made you feel needed to be included as a concept because I know there wasn't a theme going in right yeah it was maybe going back on what I was saying earlier like we going back to this original idea of just doing the studio bits and seeing what people are doing what interesting things we went into it specifically thinking like, we're not we're not going to have a theme we're not going to go into saying this show is about this which is kind of the opposite of what you usually do especially when making a group show you have an idea and then you kind of work think about the artists that might work well for that so instead we were just looking at the artists and then seeing what um bubbled up from that and we had a we were pretty sure that you know something would come up, <laughs> um, and we were right. So when we were, I mean, we're just trying to remember, like, doing the studio visits, and we, we were pretty honest with everyone, just saying just that, saying you know we're, we're just looking to see what you're doing. There isn't like this overarching theme. Um, show us your work, what it, whatever it is that you're working on. But we started to see, um, I think, even pretty early on, that even before we had made the selections, just we would come out of a studio visit and be like, wow, that person will look. Really, or their work would speak really well with this other artist that we've already talked to. We could kind of already see it starting to bubble up just from that experience, but not not completely. But um, we definitely saw. I mean, I'm thinking about <clears throat> our studio visit with Woody Diathello, who, if you've seen the show, he has big ceramic sculptures with the urns and the candles coming out of it. Um, when we were, it wasn't even so much the work, but when we were talking with him, he was saying, you know. Yeah, you know, I graduated like a year ago, but I have this great studio space, and I found a really good apartment. And I was like, who is this person who's like so positive about <laughs> living in the bigger? You never hear people say really positive things. So it was um, this this kind of one of the, this idea that came out when we were putting the show together. Once we'd selected the artists and we're thinking about the works, was that you know even in these really kind of difficult times, that that artists, the artists that we're working with, are kind of making these tentative steps of, of dismantling all sorts of institutional violence, um, but really thinking how we can move forward in these times and how, how do you begin to do that? Just how, what are the steps you can take? And just that studio visit with Woody was just so ridiculously positive, <laughs> um, which is so great. We loved it. But, um, but his work in the show is also really melancholy. If you look at it, and he's talked, he's very, very, it's very hard to get him to talk about his work. But when he does, um, you know, he has these, 
these these urns that are like kind of like funerary um, funerary urns. So they're kind of like holding holding a spirit. And you talked about a little bit about how it, it, it's sort of a memorial piece. It's meant to function like a memorial. It's kind of a generic memorial, thinking about um, a lot of violence, particularly violence against people of color. Um, but then you know, later he was talking. He said he was actually processing at that time. Um, I think the, the death of a couple of family members, and he was here in the area. And could, Back, or when he did go back, it was really different because his cousins weren't there. So there was all this sort of, all this like internal stuff that was happening. It was kind of working through. Um, but at the same time, we met him. He was really positive. So there's these kind of um, these two sides of things. So um, it was it, there was a lot of kind of moments like that. That's just one of them. Um, and then when we were you know, the way we, um, like I mentioned earlier, we're often here in meetings, so we don't necessarily get to artists and go and do the studio visits that we'd like to do. So when we started, we were like, okay, who, we don't even know where to begin. So we reached out to colleagues you know, here in the institution and other institutions, curators, artists, people we knew, and just said, like, who would you, what names, you know, we asked everyone for three to five names, and sometimes you'd get ten, sometimes you get one. Um, so we started our studio visits from there, just reaching out to people and asking, um, I just completely lost my train of thought of why I mentioned that. Oh, I know. <laughs> Sorry, just going to start it. So at the end of it, I have a list of about 150 names. Obviously, we couldn't do studio visits with all of them in the short time. We did, you know, maybe 40 or 50. And then Martin was off doing studio visits on his own with our architects and designers. But when we were going through to decide, we were looking just we looked on everyone's website just to make sure there wasn't someone we kind of missed that we felt would kind of fit with the show. And one of the artists, Jamil Hill, who the, has the photographs when you first walk in, we kind of already decided based the the bulk of the people on the show. And then we saw his photographs, and we were like, hmm, I think he really fits with the show. And um, so we did the studio visit kind of after deciding we really wanted him in the show. And then at the end of the studio visit, surprised him and said, hey, you know, actually, we would really love for you to be in the show. We've seen your work online, and we felt really already went with You actually didn't stress out. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for printing all these photos for us. This is great. We'll put these we'll in the show. <laughs> but it was, um, so again, it was like, <laughs> Not going with a theme, but seeing how things go together, and even seeing this person, just knowing from what we who else we had selected that really he needed to be in the show, and I think it was I'm so glad we included him because I think his work is really, really strong and and fits so well with everyone else. That's an answer. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I'm gonna go to the last ish question, which is a signal for you guys to think about your questions. Um, there's water there if you need to drink something before you speak. Um, my question is for all three panelists. I'd like to start with um, Rennie, um, <laughs> where we started. Um, there's there's obviously, even you mentioned it earlier, like, you know, it shifted after uh, you and Arnold left and Renee kind of had it for another two years and then it went on again and then it continued to shift the, the exhibition Bay Area now in general. Um, would you, and I think I asked a, a, a kind of a style of this question, which was, you know, like, do you think it's still relevant today? Do you think that, that kind of thing? But my question is, more in particular to, do you think that regional surveys in this manner are the kind of institutional support that needs to be happening in the Bay Area right now? Like if there was a way we could choose uh, to support what's happening today, just like we see that every iteration responds to its cultural moment, um, is, yeah, is an institutional is, is that what you would consider to be the most helpful at the moment, or how would you change it or add to it or um, edit it? Well, the honest answer is I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but um, I have some thoughts. Um, uh, the, the, the graduate school idea that I used to teach was uh, a one-person show is a curator show. And I'm sorry, the opposite. <laughs> a one-person show is an artist show. A group show is a curator's show, especially if it's a theme show. Um, the uh, survey show is uh, different. Um, 
it rhymes so much with the original purpose of Here But When, um, which, you know, to go back to what I, I started with, uh, uh, the scandal that all this city support was going to uh, the majors, um, Here But When it was set up uh, to take on that responsibility of supporting local artists. Um, I think it continues to be uh, worthwhile, um, but it is important that it, the local artists don't get ghettoized uh, into it. And I think sometimes your good has gotten away from that. Um, I think uh, that it can't be the only way. Uh, have to be, you know, uh, when I was running a small experimental place out the market before I came here, uh, you know, we first thing we wanted to do was support artists by giving them shows, and second thing was to pay them for being the shows. And then we started thinking about, well, what else can we do? And uh, residencies became uh, uh, our thought of how we could expand support of local artists. And um, I think that conversation of uh, ways to enhance the singing, because that's why we're doing this, right, uh, has to always be refreshed and, and renewed. So I was supportive of Seven because it was trying to reinvent. Um, we talked about, when we met last week, we talked about. Um, the Whitney Biennial of 1993, which was the one that was usually controversial because uh, it was political and it was uh, many more artists of color than the Whitney Biennial I've ever had, had before or probably since. And uh, the opening show that I curated here and then a couple years later, Bay Area Now, was in the context of that. And uh, what I remember having a conversation with Nayland, uh, and he said something typically brilliant that the failure of that Whitney Biennial was not in being political or, more, or diverse, but uh, that it was not well curated. <laughs> so I think that yeah. is part of the answer to your question is uh, Bay Area now. Uh, is relevant and important as long as it's well procured. Uh, Weston, as an artist, how does that resound with you? The, the, this idea of institutional support coming tiered like this, and uh, it's a multi step process as one show, as you know, what, what is Bay Area? How does Bay Area now fall into that kind of ecosystem right now? So it's funny that. Especially looking at the history of the piles, and I was so struck that that question keeps recurring, and I've heard other institutions grapple with recurring shows that way. And it, it, I kept thinking, like, as from an artist's perspective, it feels like such an a curatorial or institutional thing to be anxious about. Like, from, <laughs> for, for artists, it's, it, you know, like this is an important benchmark in our work, in our careers, and. Um, becoming part of this legacy and this conversation. And so it was something that I wanted to engage with and I still check back in with because it's, it, it, it feels like you know, that, that continuity continues and it's a, that's an important thing. And then the same, I think in the same way as like schools or you know, educational institutions or things like that, that you know, it creates this access point as an audience, as an art, artist, uh, you know, from these different things. And so there's something about having that longevity of, of thought and history and conversation. Um, and you know, I, was, I was also thinking like even in terms of like really basic educational opportunities for me as an artist, like this was the first time that I worked with the institution that had a registrar and I I, no one taught me what that meant. And the first time I worked with the institution that has security and that I had to deal with like, oh, I can't just pop in and like install in the middle of the kids. And, you know, like, and like that, Re reflecting on that, it seems like very like 
Mm -hmm. But like it was, those kind of things were really important for me as a young artist to understand like what that kind of tiering means. And so for an institution of this, and, and that, you know, it is different than like a, a group show that's much more scaled down. It is, we had large, we had space to work in that I could do an installation that was fairly significant and that, you know, having to step up to that kind of presentation and <coughs> in this kind of space, I think is an important thing in any artist development. And so, um, I, yeah, like I, I've, it's never been a question to me that that's valuable. Um, Susie is someone who just had to brag her brain for what are we doing, how are we doing this, are we doing enough, are we doing too much? Um, yeah, that is that question of, of <laughs> now I'm like, after I heard from Gary, you say, like, oh, that's such an institutional thing to worry about. I was like, oh, why would we worry? That's <laughs> 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 been really reassuring to hear. Um, I know, I'm actually learning a lot just I'm like, huh, yeah. go <laughs> figure right. out. Perspective. Um, it is very navel gazing at times, and you can't help it. I think it is, I think it is important. It just, you know, anecdotally, a lot of, um, you know, we just seen immediately as soon as the show opened, it was, you know, people, colleagues from, you know, SFAI and Mills and CCA asking to bring their classes in and wanting to take tours and, and just using, thinking of me as a resource for um, graduate and undergraduate students and, and, but for the professors, many even more people who have been in Bay Area now, mm -hmm. um, that it's, it is this kind of, almost like a source of pride for the Bay Area. Um, that was the sense I got from a lot of them, was just saying like, thank you, we need this right now. This is, because there isn't really anything else of the scope and scale. I mean, people always bring up Sika as a moment, but it's much smaller than it's usually only you know, four to six artists. It's not It's not on the same scale, saying like, look, this is what's happening right now, and it's not meant to. Um, I think that's a good thing, but I also always come back to the title of the exhibition. It's not just Bay Area, it's Bay Area now. So the now necessarily changes so much with each iteration, and you know, exactly why I agree. I think the Bay Area now seven was exactly what was um, reflective of that moment and I think it is important to have it as these sort of reflections of the time and thinking about all the research you did um, thinking back at our institutional history and the, the big graphic that you have in the gallery that all of your research but um, looking at what was happening in the world at the time and in the institution and in the exhibition not to say that they're all just like this one-to-one -one relation but that there is it is tracking these cultural moments and it also just fundamentally says that yeah there's there's really great artists doing really great work here, at least that was the intention, hopefully, <laughs> that happened. And I think that's important. I think, you know, LA does it, New York does it, like why, why shouldn't we as well say, like, look, there's a lot of really great stuff happening here. So for me, it was really important just to kind of remind myself of that. Yeah. I don't think we've ever talked about this, but like six years ago, a grad student at the Art Institute, a Peruvian mm -hmm. guy, came across the red catalog and flipped out and he redid it oh. at the Art Institute as a historical marker of one generation. Oh. Being excited about another, that was yeah. one of the most mind blowing things. That's he, he assembled some of the same pieces, mm -hmm. uh, about half the pieces that wow. were. Wow. And Martin Martin found, yeah, you that found. Which one did you find? I did that. I mean, I, I, I was part of that. Were you? Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Montero? Well, well, um, now his name. He <laughs> <laughs> was a classmate of mine. He's so terrible. Uh, Car Carlos. But that was part of the uh, graduate program at SFAI and Exhibition and Museum Studies we were thinking about. Um, that exhibitions are sort of important in the moment, but then what happens, what sort of lives on past the exhibition, which is mainly the catalog, and how would you do it differently? How would you think of it in a different way? So we um, chose Bay Area now as a really significant marker in sort of the Bay Area's ex exhibition history and then, uh, yeah, we created it. I mean, I think we had about 30% of like the original pieces um, oh, wow. that was there and they had a great video on it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a trip for me to then be six years later as like a part of like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, life is strange. I think <laughs> more than anything, that's 
what I like is the yeah. intricacies and strange coincidences of <laughs> people in bed in weird ways. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's something that drove me in this research was not just the selfish, it was like interesting, it was like novella-ish at some point. <laughs> um, but also just, yeah, it's been around for long enough that it is truly a snapshot of the Bay Area at any given time over the last 20 plus years. And I think having that go through in our, the lens of an art institution, the lens of artists, the lens of curators, um, because we do kind of pinball around so much, it's so interesting to see that Bay Area now brought everyone together in these very specific moments. And um, that to me, I think is, uh, is also something that can live on after mm -hmm. the exhibition. It's like the conversations about um, how legacy and histories can enhance innovation and creativity, right? And how they can supplement it. Um, so I think. Uh, yeah, and the book supported that too. Uh, before I worked here, I worked. I was the director of New Langton Arts, a small experimental place on Folsom, for 15 years, and um, we published an annual book documenting everything that we did uh, for every year, and those now are this archive of Northern California avant-garde practice in the late 20th century. Good job, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I think uh, we can stop there. I don't know if there's anything else that anyone wants to share. If there's any questions, thank you. I mean, has a question? Yeah, well, it's just kind of building off of what Martin was talking about and what we were just saying here about the what lives on after the exhibition. And Weston, we heard a little bit from you about your relationship with the cohort and how those relationships have have carried on, but I'm sort of curious um, too for Renny and Susie, especially, you know, Susie, you're kind of emphasizing and I totally empathize about how it's sometimes difficult to get out for studio visits and to like actually have conversations. But if it, if this type of show where you are getting this kind of like intimate one-on-one -on -one time that's really carved out to be thinking about what artists are doing, if it acts as a kind of catalyst in some way for future relationships and, and how you stay in contact with an artist who's been in a show like this, you know, where you're really thinking about how they are contextualizing the place and telling and with other people. And I know the show is just ending today, so this is like maybe premature, but um, maybe just thinking a little bit about what the, how those relationships continue or um, and how you help to continue to support artists that are really I think um, doing studio visits, whether it's for a survey show or, or just uh, is crucially important. Yeah. Uh, when I started at CJM uh, across the street, they had never done studio visits. You know, I instituted it every Friday mm. uh, that we would go at least to one. So I think it's it's really important. Uh, I mean, the reason you never see curators at parties is because they, they don't want to be put up against the wall. And <laughs> 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 uh, it's one reason. <laughs> um, so it's a way uh, to be kind of public, and, uh, and it is inspiring. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things when we, once we did like the bulk of the studio visits, you know, a couple of weeks, it was like, oh, I'm going to keep doing this. We, this is such a great practice. And then, you know, the work piles up and it's harder to do it. And I haven't kept up in the way I'd like, but I do think it's incredibly important. And the amount that I learned just doing all those studio visits in that period of time, I joke that it was like going on like 40 or 50 first dates, because that's kind of what it is. <laughs> you know, that slightly awkward moment, but it's, it's so valuable. And, um, you know, thinking about for future things, I, I have this list, and that's that's just the names that people, that people gave to us. It's still like 150 yeah. areas that, if I am like thinking about things, I have I have that resource, but I don't actually hope to add to it. And in terms of of how do you cultivate the relationships going forward, that's a, that's something that I 
I struggle with because I don't think I'm as good at it as I would as I would like to be. Um, again, as you get stuck in the day to day, and you're you know, um, going, like, oh, are you thinking about the next show? Because we start doing slang show tomorrow. I'm like thinking about, oh my god, that's like all I've been thinking about for the last several weeks. We're like deep in it, and it's like you're already on the next thing, and it's hard to um, remember to keep up. And I, I, I hope, I hope that the relationships forged in this exhibition do last. And so many of them, like Andrew, who was in here earlier, was doing his. <laughs> he made his own residency where he's been working throughout the show, and he's like actually just basically part of the institution now. <laughs> and he's been here, you know, three, four days a week for six months, and someone like that, it's like, hey, we're not going to see him every day anymore. That's so weird. And um, it's funny because Wes and I were talking recently because of the show that he was in. That Martin mentioned in Work in Progress, which was also thinking about what you said, Randy, about how to use support artists. It was basically a show that was residencies that each, you know, we had two artists in the gallery at a time for like a month, and then it rotated to a couple times. And we were, I was like, hey, how did that go for you three years later? And we're gathering feedback, thinking about doing those things. And I, like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh my God, how am I just asking them for feedback now? <laughs> but that was such a busy year, and I, I'm so grateful to Wes and everyone who. Like responded that it was just like oh yeah it's great it uses it as a chance to catch up and I'm actually really grateful for having to have to do that because it is a way to like catch up and check in and a reminder that you know we can talk more than just when we cross each other in the street which is where we usually see each other <laughs> um, and but you know other artists I've worked with have reached out and like oh I'm applying for this residency can I just use a reference we write a recommendation and I'm always like so happy to do that because it's it's one small way of being able to continually support artists, but it's um, puts the onus on the artist to reach out. So I have like, to like, tell everyone, like, always feel free to reach out. Um, I'm happy to do it. So it's, it's something that I do struggle with. And I, um, <laughs> anyone has suggestions? Because <laughs> I, I don't want the relationship to end just because the exhibition ends. Because um, you, you care about these people. You care about their work. You want, you want to continue to support them. Or just have a drink. <laughs> well, it's a good you credit for, I mean, I was thinking about work for a show because to Remy's earlier point about artists feeling, feeling ghettoized in these kinds of processes that being able to have another opportunity in the space that's outside of the area now is one of those important gestures and it's being able to work with Susie and Martin and Timon on um, that show was, was really important and felt like, oh, this mm -hmm. is a reinvestment in this dialogue institutionally even if the specific folks on staff had turned over since then and so um, that's it, it, it happens <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I, I think it, it even happens uh, when you don't know about it when you're not actually in touch with the artist but they follow your work in the same way that we follow their work mm -hmm. Barry McGee used to say to me uh, when he had his retrospective at Berkeley years ago I interviewed him for uh, some gallery. And, <laughs> uh, he said that New Langton Arts was his education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he'd never said that before. Oh. Um, I can also speak to the to uh, as a as an intern, as a researcher, as an independent contractor. Uh, <laughs> coming in and out of the institution, I, I feel like similarly I was excited to be a part of it, but then also like I have never worked with a registrar at that point. Like, I mean, I'd work at a gallery, but not at an institution. I had never. So in terms of the things I was trying to learn, it was a slew of things that I had heard of and I had like seen happen around me, but I hadn't actually taken part in and this experience. Um, Susie and Martin have been really great in offering resources and support and making stuff like this happen. So uh, thank you to you guys. And if there aren't any more questions, anyone? Any question? Um, how do you, I mean, how is Bay Area now going to continue? Or how would you hope it continues in terms of like thinking about time? Is it going to be something that happens every two years or something that happens more in response to when it's needed? Like, like how do we think about urgency in terms of like setting up a timetable or not for the Bay Area now? Especially if, also kind of, my other 
part two question, but I think might tie into this is like then how does it become kind of a Bay Area story in terms of what, how it's initiated or not? Um, and I know I messed with like a little bit of the beginning. I think it, it, it used to be more of a biennial. Right? Sure. 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 Yeah, okay, yeah. but then yeah. I like it, like one of my first years and it came back recently, and I feel like it's it's had a great response that it's come back. But yeah, like looking forward, what would you what would you hope for? This one was actually four years since the last one because once Lucia started, she didn't feel like we had enough time to do it. And sure. there's one that was like two years, but we're actually I did not want to like we're on track. <laughs> if we had actually done it every three years since '97, this would be the correct year for eight. So <laughs> it's it's meant to be trying out. Doesn't quite always happen. So um, yeah. I think I know it's like oh my god, do we have to think about the next one. Right, I think it's the last day. Um, I mean, I hope it continues. I think there's always the question after it ends, like will will the next one happen? I think that's just the nature of kind of what we've been talking about, and do you continue with these? Um, we're sort of in a transitional moment in the institution of rethinking like what our focus is and um, you know, having these campaigns in the next year or two that are very specifically focused, but part of that is a focus on the Bay Area and the local, so I would think that it continues. I hope that it does. It would potentially be in what year are we in? So it would be 2022. Oh my god, that sounds really far away. <laughs> um, or maybe 2021, 20, because we opened it in 2018. Um, <laughs> sorry, I get very Um I mean, I, I, especially after today, like in this talk, I really, I really hope that it does continue, because I think it does serve this really valuable purpose of so many of the things that we've talked about of it being a marker for the Bay Area, something that shows what's happening right now, but something that also that this institution is so tied to this institution, and I think in a really good way. Um, and I uh, would hope we could take a little time off and then maybe be like, okay, let's start thinking about it in like six months to a year. I mean, I would hope we could be kind of, even though it was four years in between, we didn't, we kind of had a really compressed timetable, so it would have a little more time, but um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers everything you're asking, but sort of, it's always an unknown. One of the things that strikes me from the question too about, about where the story becomes is the work that Pijin did in assembling this kind of timeline because I think it, it wasn't until looking at those documents that I got a sense of that art and that narrative and so whatever can be done to, to put that more forward and have people, even artists being selected, coming into it, being able to access that and see what, what they're stepping into, I think it's, it's a very valuable tool. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more questions? Uh, well, thank you to our panelists again for, for spending the day in the room with us and everyone else for coming. Uh, yeah, have a great Sunday. Thank you. Oh, yeah. This is the last day of the show, so if you haven't seen it, please do do uh, a walk through. Thank <laughs> you.